Good morning, and welcome on another glorious Lord's Day. Don't panic. We haven't started services at the church without you. It isn't a secret. One of the things that we're doing is experimenting with different elements of the service, things that we're going to try to incorporate even in the videos as we get closer and closer to the time when they're finally going to allow us to meet together, something that we're looking forward to very much. So at the moment, uh, I'm in a suit again, which feels wonderful, and we're, I'm back in the pulpit. So as the weeks pass, you will see different elements being incorporated that we hope will just uh, help in the sense of being back at church until we can be back together again. Now with that being explained, I'm going to ask you to bow with me for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your faithfulness. And as we look to your word this morning, Father, we pray that you will use Peter's words to encourage us, to challenge us, most importantly, Heavenly Father, to edify us. And we'll commit ourselves to you even now as we look to your word. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Now, as we begin this morning, I would like to read 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 9, to maintain the flow of thought from last week's message into this morning's message. And I'm going to break the passage up in accordance with the way these two messages have been put together. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Now that's where we ended last week. Now beginning this morning in verse 6, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, in order that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, you love. Though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls." Now again, Peter began by addressing the pilgrims of the dispersion in that whole area of Asia Minor, and noted that they were, in fact, from heaven's perspective, the elect who were guarded by the power of God. And when he says, in this you greatly rejoice, Peter is referring back to the blessings that he had listed in verses 3 through 5. The living hope the inheritance, even their very selves are held in God's hand until the day the fullness of salvation is revealed. It's in these very things that they greatly rejoiced, even in the midst of their current trials. Herein Peter uses the word hagaliao, which means to exult, to be exceedingly glad, to show one's joy by leaping and skipping, denoting excessive ecstatic joy and delight, which is not really my style, but that is what he is referring to here. And Peter is contrasting what is in the heart by faith with what is experienced in this world in their tribulations for a little while. Now, Peter does not dismiss or minimize the nature of these trials. He acknowledges they have, in fact, been grieved by them. And herein he's using the Greek word lupeo, which we've seen before. It means to be made extremely sorrowful or distressed. Their trials and tribulations were as severe as they were several, and yet faith enabled them to overcome them rather than to succumb to them. Again, 
Peter contrasts the brevity of their trials with the continuous, the ongoing exaltation expressed in this word, agaliazzo. It is translated here simply as greatly rejoice. And he reminds them and us as well that trials are temporary. We seem to be going on forever. These four weeks are probably feeling more like four years. But in point of fact, this is brief. And again, this fact is being affirmed by another witness as well. And I'm reading from James chapter 1, verse 12. Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Now, compare that directly with verses 6 and 7 here in 1 Peter chapter 1. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, in order that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. When we looked at James, James expresses that the purpose of trials is to demonstrate the quality of a man's faith, i.e., when he has been approved. Here in 1 Peter, the purpose of trials is to prove, to reveal, to ascertain the genuineness of a man's faith. This dokimion, which is literally the actual proving or the testing process by which anything is evaluated or purified, Peter uses the image of gold and says that the purification of gold is in fact a weak example of what is actually happening in their lives in this time of testing. But all of it is done to establish the purity, whether it's the purity of the gold, the purity of our faith, the purity of our walk with Christ. And Paul uses this same imagery in the context of testing works for the purpose of rewards. The results of the test and the outcome are going to be consistent. We're looking now at Paul. He's writing this in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verses 11 through 15, and notice the repetition of themes and ideas in these different passages. First James, then Peter, now Paul. No other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, Each one's work will become clear or obvious, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, and the word means completely consumed, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as by fire." Now, once again, that foundation is Jesus Christ. This is the beginning of our walk with the Lord. This is that moment of salvation. On this foundation, we then build our Christian lives. And this is where Paul talks about the gold, silver, the precious stones, the wood, the hay, and the stubble. Each one of those have to be purified in some manner. And the day, he said, will declare it. Looking ahead now to the day when the believer's life, the believer's works are judged not in reference to salvation, but in reference to rewards. And that's why Paul says, if anything remains of that man's works, what remains will be rewarded. But if nothing remains, if the whole of a man's life was for not for Christ, then in fact there will be no reward. But notice this, he is saved, yet so is by fire. Now we have James, Peter, and Paul agreeing that it's the actual enduring of the trials that prove a man's character, it proves his faith, it proves the quality of his works. What is more, 
all three men agree that while the trial takes place in the here and now, the reward, the praise, the honor, and the glory will not come until the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. And here I remind us that while man desires, if not demands, immediate gratification, God calls upon us to develop patience through hope. And with that in mind, I want to take you to another passage from Paul. It's Romans chapter 8, 18 through 25. It is a familiar passage. We're simply adding reference to reference here. Romans chapter 8 and verse 18. Again, this is Paul writing, For I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope, because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. We know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until not. Not only that, we also, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly awaiting the adoption, the redemption of the body. For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. Why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Now, in the beginning, Paul is making the point that there is an impatience. Even the creation around us is impatient to be made back again to what God had originally made it to be, uncorrupted and undefiled. In like manner, we are impatient. Paul uses the imagery of a tent. We want to put off this tent, this earthly body, not to be unclothed, but that we can be clothed upon with that perfect body that God will provide for us. Now, all of this is couched in the arena of hope. Hope is the word elpis. It's used five times in these last couple of verses. And it literally means the desire of something good with every expectation of obtaining it. The desire for something good with every expectation of obtaining it. And as I've said a number of times, there's hope and then there's hope. There's, I hope it will come. I don't know if it will come. I'm not sure that it will come. But I'm hoping. And then there is the biblical context of hope. Is this sure and certain affirmation that what God has said will come? come to be. Now, the hope of this world is tenuous at best because it's tied to the uncertainty of life itself. None of us are promised tomorrow. I, I will go to bed tonight. I may be in heaven in my morning. We don't know. You walk out of your house, you get into your car, you go somewhere, you have no guarantee you're going to get back home again. We don't know. Everything in this life, in a sense, is tenuous. But the hope that is from God is born of faith, and it's more certain than the rising of the sun. Listen to these words from 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13. If we are faithless, he abides faithful. He cannot deny himself. We go through this world almost with the sense that we're in control and everything depends on us. And when the truth really is... We're not in control of anything, and everything depends on God. And so, as we think about that, I have more faith in the sun rising than I do in being alive tomorrow. If Christ has promised to remember a cup of cold water, just a cup of cold water that's given in his name, we can be certain the character, the faith, and the obedience that has been tried by fire and proven to be of quality that deserves recognition shall be recognized as 
well. There is not one thing that we have done in and for the glory of God that will not be re recommend, remembered and rewarded. But these rewards and accolades are not for this time, nor should we seek to receive them from men. It's Christ himself who will reward his faithful servants at the white throne. It is God who will bless us in accordance with our faithfulness. How often have we spoken with joy and anticipation of the blessed hope, the return of Christ our Lord and Savior for his own. And in that context, I would remind us that it is Christ we should seek. It is Christ that we're looking forward to see. Yes, the rewards have been promised to us, but they are secondary. It is looking to him, seeing him. This is what we're waiting for. As the, the words of the song, and I shall see him face to face. Again, I want to maintain the unity of Peter's thought because we've been moving back and forth from James to Peter to Paul. And we're coming back to 1 Peter chapter 1, again 6 through 9, which is the core text for this morning. And Peter writes, again looking back to the previous verses, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you've been grieved by various trials, in order that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, you love. Though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. As I've read through this passage, my mind went back to those words that Jesus spoke to Thomas. He said, Thomas, blessed are you, for you have believed because you have seen. More blessed are those who have not seen, yet have believed. And this is what Peter is speaking of here in this particular passage. They did not see the Lord. They had not seen him, and yet they loved him. They had not seen him, and yet they rejoiced. And he uses this phrase, with joy inexpressible and full of glory. If you have ever said to someone, I'm at a loss for words, you have just a small taste of what Peter is trying to convey here. It's that living hope through the resurrection of Christ from the dead that causes us to greatly rejoice. The circumstances, they're not important. We are not rejoicing in the circumstances or in the moment. We're rejoicing in what God has promised us. It's the genuineness of our faith that brings praise, honor, and glory to Christ. It's by faith that he, we love him, even though we have not seen him. We're walking by faith. We're depending on the word of God and God's faithfulness. That we, though we have not seen him, have an image, if you will, in our minds and our hearts. An image that will be fulfilled well above and beyond our hopes and dreams. It's by faith that our hearts are filled with joy inexpressible and full of glory, regardless of what we're experiencing in the moment, even in the midst of the various trials and tribulations of this hour. Think about that phrase, of this hour. It helps us to reinforce that we're looking at just a brief moment of time. Time is moving on. This moment is being passed by. There is something more, something greater, something better lying ahead for us. So we have joy in the midst of trials. We have hope in the midst of tribulations. We have peace of mind even in the midst of persecution. And it's in that context that I'm taking you now to Romans chapter 8, verses 31 through 39. Romans 8, 31 through 39, where again, Paul is echoing the thoughts of Peter. 
And we're looking again at this comparison between the moment and eternity. Romans 8.31 What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? If he's given us the best, why wouldn't he give us the rest? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? It is Christ who died, furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, Paul's epistle to the Romans was written in A.D. 58. This is about four years after the beginning of Nero's reign, but about six years before the writing of 1 Peter. And so, as we look at that, we can see evidence of persecution in Rome, whereas we understand from Peter's first epistle that he was speaking to those of the persecution of the dispersion who were in all of Asia Minor. And so we see with these passage of these few years how the persecution had intensified, how it had grown from simply being in Rome to eventually being anywhere and everywhere under Rome's influence. And notice how Paul writes of charges against God's elect, of tribulation, distress, peril, famine, nakedness, and sword. These are very things that Peter will speak of as we continue through his epistle. And he reminds the brethren here, yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And again, because we so often need reinforcement, John tells us in 1 John 4, 4, you are of God, little children, and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Nor should we be surprised these many centuries later to find that we are beset by trials and tribulations. Jesus told his disciples in John 16, and this encouragement is as true for us now as it was then. He wrote, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. This is our hope. Hope is something that you anticipate, that you absolutely expect will come to pass. He said the tribulations will be there, but don't worry. I have overcome the world. That's his promise. And like so many others before us, we must choose between fear and faith. On the one hand, there is the fear of the known and the fear of the unknown, a threat to be avoided at all costs, threats or trials or tribulations that we can see and those that lurk somewhere in the shadows. On the other is faith in Jesus Christ our Lord, by which we embrace the trials for the glory of God. I say embrace, perhaps not always willingly, but certainly so, because we engage these things, and we do that in faith, recognizing that he has overcome the world. If we choose fear, it will isolate us. It will overwhelm us in our solitude, and it will destroy us. If we choose faith, it will unite us. It will empower us to care for one another in love. It will give us the victory over every trial and test. 
God has promised there's no temptation overtaking you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow us to be tested beyond that which we are able, but will, with the testing, provide a means of escape that we may be able to bear it. Now, I have expressed, and perhaps you would embrace the thought as well, I just wish the Lord didn't think so much of me. But the Lord knows what we can take, what we can handle, what He is able to accomplish in us and through us. And remember, trials and testings do not produce faith. Trials and testings do not increase our faith. Our faith comes from God. Our faith comes from the Word of God. As we grow, so too will the trials and temptations grow. God will stretch us a little more each day, but never beyond the ability that we have through the ministry of God in our hearts. Tests just provide the opportunity to exercise our faith, to demonstrate our faith before God and the world. And in that moment, God will be glorified and the world will be mystified. And in that, we will rejoice. Please bow with me for a moment of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your promises. And we pray, Father, as James and Paul and Peter have told us, these trials are but for a moment. We thank you for your word, for the promises that you give us. And we pray, Father, that you would strengthen us, enable us to walk by faith. And Father, we'll give you the glory for what you accomplish in and through our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, before we actually close, I'd like to encourage you to take time later today to read Hebrews chapter 11. As you read of these heroes of the faith, I would like to remind you that they were just ordinary men and women who trusted God in the midst of their particular trials and tribulations. They believed God, they walked with God, and if I may, God made them heroes. We're no better or worse than they were. Their God is no different than our God. He has not changed. Let God be glorified and the world mystified as we rejoice today in this particular trial. Father, thank you again. We commit ourselves into your care as we go forth. In Jesus' name, amen. Shine.